Oh my goodness, thank you. It's a delight to hear bells yet once again. Friends, welcome to worship this day here at Village Presbyterian Church. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us, that you have been called into worship with us. Hey, it's our tradition here during these months when we are not able to worship together in person to take the passion of the peace moment and to use our phones or to send an email. We've heard from several of you that when we invite the passion of the peace, we don't give you time to do that. So we're gonna invite you to pick up your iPad or your phone or some other device and just for a few seconds, Elisa, Dr. Bickers is going to play and we're gonna take some time for you to pass the peace, send a text. So friends, the peace of Christ be with you. Friends, last week I asked you if you would please pray for the leadership of this church as we go through a two-hour anti-racism training workshop. That happened last Sunday afternoon. Nearly 60 people, leaders, ruling elders, deacons, the two co-moderators of our Presbyterian women, leaders from Stephen Ministry, they all gathered with your pastors and your staff. We had a marvelous first conversation about what it means for Village Church to be a more inclusive and diverse and equitable congregation, what it means for us to invest, invest in what it means to be anti-racist in these days. Thank you for your prayers. Please continue to pray for us as we grow into this journey to which Christ is calling us. So we're continuing our series on being the church. Last week we talked about the letters of Christ. Today we have a new image from the Apostle Paul. I am so glad you are here for worship on this day. The Reverend Zach Walker is going to lead us in the call to worship. So let's be called to worship. Friends, we have reached out to one another, so now let us take a moment to reach out to God and call ourselves to worship. Because we gather today, finding time in this morning or this afternoon, this evening, whenever you are participating with us, but time to remind ourselves that we are not alone. Not only are we together in spirit with others of the village community, we are together in the living spirit of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and our friend. Because we are not alone, let us take a moment as we gather to pray for those who have touched our lives. So take a moment with me. Pray for someone who has helped you this past week. Pray for someone who you miss right now. For someone you might be able to help this week. Pray by name those who are a part of your family. To pray for someone in or outside your family, but someone with whom you struggle. Pray not for a person, but for some issue that you are struggling with in your life. Pray the name of someone in whom and with whom you might be able to talk about and share that struggle with. We pray these things because we are connected, and that is a good thing. Now I invite you to join together and sing in the hymn, Praise Ye the Lord, as we continue our worship.
Hey everyone, welcome to my kitchen. Today we're going to explore the meaning of our scripture reading with the process of making bread. In the second letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul tells the faithful that they are treasures in simple clay jars. He reminds us that even in challenging times, God is still at work. And while we may seem like simple creatures, we carry in us the life of Jesus. I have found this message that the Apostle Paul writes about especially meaningful while we have been at home. One of the activities I have taken on is baking bread. You see the simple ingredients, flour, oil, eggs, water, and yeast, once combined, transform into a loaf of bread. With time and patience, we see this transformation take place, just like God is constantly transforming us with love and patience in challenging circumstances. It's the simple things that are and have the power to create the most beautiful things in this world. So friends, I encourage you to think about what simple things are you appreciating during this time. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for creating beautiful things, both complex and simple. May we remember to cherish them always. Walk in love, friends. Friends, I invite you now to spend some time together in prayer. Let's bow our heads. God of all people, God of all nations, today we pray for all that receives the love of your touch. We pray for our friends and our families and for strangers. We pray for our communities and for the communities we do not know. We pray for our own country and for countries claimed by others as their own. We pray that the rhetoric of division that surrounds us, that threatens to ensnare heads and hearts, will not claim us. But we do feel it, God. We are angry or tempted by angry or by anger and suspicion of each other. We are afraid. In the face of all the yelling and sniping and sneering, we appeal to you, God who creates all that is good, asking you for strength and grace and courage. Call to our hearts. Point us to the treasure that lies in each of us, the treasure that has the capacity to love. Send your spirit of love and your justice to us. Touch those who are sick with healing. 
For those who are worried and tired, we ask for the touch of peace. Stand alongside those who grieve the loss of loved ones. Surround them with friendship and deep compassion. In this time, God, too, we pray for our schools and our teachers, principals, school nurses, students, and parents as they work to figure out how to make school happen in safe, supportive, and creative ways. And in that, God, give us patience. This is an imperfect time. It is a messy time. It is a chaotic time. Help us to see beyond our long list of frustrations to you. Give us comfort in the beauty of the world. Give us perspective in the grace of the arts and the act of creativity. Give us joy in the gift of dear friends. Help us to find clear wisdom and hope for living in these days. God, you touch our lives in ways we are both aware of and unaware of, and we, received all, we receive all of it as a gift, and we give thanks. We pray these things, mingling our voices with the voice of Jesus, who prayed with steady trust, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So friends, prepare our hearts and minds together as we hear the word of God. I invite you to pray with me, please. So, O oh God, this word is your word to us this day and throughout all generations. We pray, O oh God, that you would remove from inside of us anything that might hinder us from hearing your word, from acting on your word afresh and anew this day. Thank you, O oh God, for coming to us in the person of Jesus Christ and for continuing with us in this word for us today. Amen. Friends, the reading for us comes from the second letter to the Corinthian church. This is chapter 4. It's verses 7 through 12. So listen for the word of God and follow along as you see the scripture on the screen. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. So we're continuing the sermon series. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. Last week we talked about how he gave them the image that you are letters of Christ because the gospel is written upon your hearts, upon your living, beating human hearts. And this week, the Apostle Paul gives the believers in Corinth a different image. The apostle says, for we have this treasure in clay jars, in ordinary clay jars. It's interesting, 
there is a contemporary Corinth. It sits in between, on this isthmus, between the Aegean Sea and the Ionian Sea. It's still on this direct trade route between Asia and all of southern Europe. The Corinthian ancient city is about uh, eight or 10 kilometers outside of the contemporary city. About 30,000 people are in the contemporary city. You can go, some of you have, and walk around the ancient city. What's interesting, archeologists have talked about this. What they find is shards of pottery and they're intrigued because the pottery that they find in the ancient city of Corinth is not particularly decorative. They talked about how different communities around the Mediterranean would sort of carve out an identity for themselves by how they would decorate their pottery. The Corinthians didn't do that, apparently. They were more interested in the pottery being just very functional, possibly because they were on such an active trade route. They weren't as interested in making the pottery pretty or decorative. They just wanted it to serve the purpose. So no wonder the apostle talks about how we have this treasure in clay jars, in plain, ordinary clay jars. You look at this and you wouldn't think to yourself that there's treasure in here. You probably wouldn't even put treasure in here. But the apostle uses this as a powerful, powerful image to say to these new believers, you may think you're ordinary. You may think that you have nothing special about you, but that's for a reason. Because the treasure of Christ is in you and because you are just ordinary and plain folks, people will know the treasure in you is not because of you. It's because of the God who created you, the God who redeemed you, and the God who sustains you even now. Ordinary things. What I've realized in these days for you and for me is that ordinary things, they've taken on a treasured meaning now. You know, uh, part of the privilege of being a professor at a seminary over those years is I would get invited, high honor, I would get invited to, to preach at a service of ordination and installation. My students would graduate, they would get a call to a church, and I'd be invited to go preach there and to see them in their new place. Kristen invited me to go to her church, the First Presbyterian Church of Poland, Ohio. This is about an hour and a half northwest of Pittsburgh into the central part of Ohio. It's a rural part of the state. These are farm folks and small town folks, Poland, Ohio. We had a wonderful celebration for her ordination and installation service. It was in the early afternoon, and then we had this amazing, amazing covered dish supper. The church members had gone all out, and they had made amazing home-cooked foods, pies and breads. Oh, I had my first pierogies. I never had a pierogi before until I went to Poland, Ohio, to the First Presbyterian Church. I didn't know what they were. And I was next to Kristen, the new pastor, and said, Kristen, what are these? And she said, they're pierogies. And I said, I don't know what those are. And she said, oh, they're like your pot stickers, like gyoza in Japanese. And I said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. It was an amazing meal. The people were so lovely and warm. I had to catch a flight out of Pittsburgh Airport that night to get back to Atlanta so I could teach the next morning in class. And a ruling elder very kindly drove me the hour and a half to get to the airport. Before I left the church, though, some of the ladies came out to the parking lot and they had prepared for me a plate of leftovers from the tables. And sure enough, there were pierogies there, but also cakes and pies, parts of casseroles, I was so grateful, so touched. They put foil over it and put it in a bag and said, please take this with you. I was going to the car and Kristen came up to me and said, Roger, you don't have to take that. And I said, Kristen, this is really good food. I'll eat this on the plane going home. So go to the Pittsburgh airport and it was actually quiet. And I was so grateful because I was a little tight on time. So I needed to get to the plane and 
went to the TSA check-in, uh, did my rollerboard, did my robe, did my backpack, and then put my food in that gray bin, slid it into the machine, went through, came out the other side, got my rollerboard, got my robe, got my backpack, and waited, and waited. And I could see the belt, and the belt on the machine was going, er, 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 er. And I thought, ugh, come on. It's just a plate of food. And I sort of looked around the side, and there was a lovely woman there, African-American woman in that bright blue TSA shirt. And I could see she was looking at the screen. And she finally stood up, let it come out of the machine, and stood up and pulled it and said, excuse me, sir, this is yours. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, what is it? And I said, I'm sorry, it's actually a plate of food. And she said, oh. And she could see the foil, and she said, I can't see through that foil. What is it again? And I said, it's a plate of church food. I just came from a church, and it's church food, and I've got this flight to catch. And she said, well, you came from a church. And I said, yes, ma'am, uh, Poland, Ohio, the Presbyterian church. I was in my suit and tie, Poland, Ohio, the Presbyterian church. And she said, oh, okay, um, this is church food. And I said, yes, ma'am. She goes, like from rural, I said, yeah, a small town, rural as well, farm folks, great people. She said, yeah, church food. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, they made this, and I said, yes. And then she stopped, looked at me, looked around, and leaned in and said, I'll buy it off you. And I, I, I said, oh, well, um, actually, I was going to eat that on, on the flight back. That's my dinner. And she said, well, so you just came from this church? And I said, yes, ma'am, I did. And she said, oh, well, didn't Jesus talk about sharing? And I said, uh, uh, ma'am, the Lord Jesus, um, Lamb of God, never talked about sharing food in the Pittsburgh airport. And she went, ah, okay, fine, just take your food. Okay, fine, so I was on the plane eating my food, and I thought to myself, you know, you should have just given her your food. Okay, fine, thank you. I thought about that, but I thought about it too late. A little less judgment from you, please, thank you very much. Didn't you listen three weeks ago when Tom R. preached about judge not lest you be judged? Thank you, thank you. Stupid, stupid, sinner, sinner, stupid. But what intrigued me was that this ordinary plate of food, casseroles, pierogies, it was treasure. And she knew it. You know, before the turn of the century, this guy named John Naisbitt wrote this book and talked about America megatrends. And he said, in the 21st century, among the megatrends, one of them is, with the rise of high-tech commensurate is going to come the rise of high-touch. With the rise of technology commensurate is going to come the rise of American people who are desperate for a sense of home, who are desperate for a sense of touch, of what is true and real. Church food from a a celebration in Poland, Ohio. Crafts that come from our sewing ministry, mission sewing on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Quilts that are made by hand. Scars and hats that are knitted together. Pickles that you put up over the winter. Kimchi that you make and give to me. I've got a zucchini the size of my head, and that is saying something because I have a big head. I don't know how they lifted it to get it to my porch. But all this looks ordinary to the undiscerning eye, but it's treasure. In this day and age, it's treasure. Those meals you make for that meal train, that's treasure. That picture you draw and give, that's treasure. 
We live in an age of technology. There is no questioning that. And technology can be wonderful and good and essential, especially in these days. But with the rise of technology is going to come the rise of people who are desperate for touch, for those home-baked meals, for those crafts. Data is saying right now that more of people feel like they are isolated and completely alone. That handwritten note, that card that you send, it's not just ordinary, it's treasure. So again, teaching at Columbia Seminary, One of our students that we gathered to us in the fall came from the Coca-Cola headquarters, which is there in Atlanta. He was in the marketing department and he was sort of being fast-tracked. Kyle was being fast-tracked as an executive. And he got a call to ministry and decided to leave that job. I was talking about this when I was teaching class and he actually said, you know, it makes him think about this moment. He was a project leader for some kind of a marketing venture for Coca-Cola and he made some presentation in an auditorium there at the headquarters, and uh, two days later, he got in the inter-office mail a card in an embossed envelope, and the back of the envelope just said, M. Kent. Mutar Kent was the CEO of Coca-Cola Enterprises International. He opened the card, looked at it, and there's this handwritten note. It said, Dear Kyle, caught your presentation. Very impressed. Liked your ideas. Liked your spirit even more. Glad you're on our team, M. Kent. Kyle says he was holding it up in his cubicle and looking at it, And the guy across, in the cubicle across, looked over and said, what is that? And Kyle said, I think think it's a handwritten letter from Mr. Kent. And that guy said, seriously? And came over and looked at it and said, can I look at it? And he goes, sure. He looked at it and said, hey, said to the floor, look, Kyle got a handwritten letter from Mutar Kent. People got up, they came to his cubicle, they looked over, they were like, ooh, can I touch that? Ooh, can I hold that? Wow. Kyle's boss said, Kyle, you need to get that framed. So his boss sent it downstairs and paid for it to get framed. Kyle still had it when he came to seminary. The next day he came to school, to the class, and showed it to me. And he said, I know it's kind of silly, but the fact that Mr. Kent heard my presentation and took the time to send me a handwritten note, I'll treasure this for the rest of my life. I said, Kyle, when you're a pastor, remember the power of that handwritten note. He's serving a church in Louisiana. I know for a fact that Kyle writes a lot of handwritten notes. (laughs) You're thinking, Roger, it's just a plate of church food, or it's just a handwritten note scribbled for a few minutes. No, no, then you're not even paying attention because we have this treasure in clay jars. I know, it looks ordinary, it looks plain, but looks can be deceiving. We have this treasure in clay jars. And for people who are desperate to have a sense that they matter, who are desperate to have a sense that they are not in this alone, it means something today when we say to them, when we reach out to them, when we speak to them and show them that you may be afflicted in every way, but you are not crushed. You may be perplexed, but you are not driven to despair. You may be persecuted, but you are not forsaken. 
You may be struck down, but you will not be destroyed because we have this treasure in clay jars. This treasure is ours. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the good news. It is the grace for us all. And we are Christ Church. And we have been here for nearly 2,000 years. And we may look plain and ordinary to you, and that's okay, because it's not about us. It is about the God of the universe. It is about Jesus Christ, who is Lord of the church. And we have done this only because Christ has allowed us. Christ has called us to it, and we are still here. It's not about us. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit who is this treasure in ordinary, plain clay jars. So write that note. Draw that picture. Bake that bread, sew that pillow, because the world needs to know that Christ is alive. Thanks be to God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
So as Roger spoke, we are ordinary things. We are ordinary clay jars with the capacity for sharing a treasure that is hidden within us. We have the capacity for taking what is ordinary and making it into something special. As Claire shared with us about bread making, it is as though we are yeast that in the communities around us, we have the capacity to make things rise, to elevate. That, friends, is treasure springing forth from clay jars. Not long ago, I was in the Boundary Waters, and if there is one thing that feels like an ordinary something at home, but feels extraordinary when you are camping for days on end, it is the food. The meals that we had there were simple, and I would wager to say I wouldn't think as highly of them if I cooked it here at home. But because of the situation, because of the ways in which we are living, those simple meals became delicacies while we were there. That, that is the way in which something ordinary can be transformed into something amazing. And so in this time, in this time, we are particularly aware of the ways that things that were once ordinary can be transformative right now. That a simple touch, a simple act of caring and of love. It is something that you can transform in your life, in someone else's life. And so my question as we go from this place, from this time of worship, is what is something that you can do to share of your treasure? What is something that you can do to make what was once ordinary into something in some small way extraordinary? Think of the name of a person that you can reach out to. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, but certainly this week, that you could share some treasure with them, and in so doing, transform a small piece of this creation. Friends, go with that hope, with that mandate, because we are called to be those people. So friends, remember this, letters of Christ, you, letters of Christ, because the gospel is written upon your hearts. 
you treasure in ordinary clay jars because Christ lives in you. So friends, now unto God, who by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or imagine unto one God, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen.